Did you know that in the U.S. someone dies from a stroke like every four minutes? And a surprising number of those strokes, they're actually linked to this heart rhythm disorder that you might not even know you have called atrial fibrillation. We've got a stack of your research on this, so let's deep dive into atrial fibrillation, its connection to stroke risk, and really what you need to know to stay healthy. It's a critical area to understand for sure. Atrial fibrillation, or AFib as it's often called, is way more common than many people realize. Okay, so for anyone who's not familiar, can you explain what exactly is going on in the heart when someone has AFib? Well, in the simplest terms, it's like an electrical system glitch. Instead of the heart beating in a regular, you know, coordinated rhythm, the atria, those are the top chambers of the heart. They quiver or fibrillate. Oh, so like a fluttery heartbeat. Is that something that people actually feel happening or is it more of a silent thing? That's a really important point, actually. AFib, it can be kind of sneaky. Some people experience noticeable palpitations or like a racing heart. Some even chest discomfort. But for others, it's completely silent. They wouldn't have a clue that anything is amiss until, well, potentially a major event like a stroke. See, that's kind of alarming to me. So we've got this irregular heartbeat situation often going unnoticed. How does that increase the risk of a stroke? Can you explain the connection to me like I'm five years old? Okay, okay. imagine like a lazy river. You ever been on one of those? Yeah. So in a normal, healthy heart, blood flows smoothly through the chambers, just like a lazy river. But with AFib, that irregular rhythm, it disrupts the flow. It's creating these little eddies and pools where blood can stagnate in the atria, particularly in an area called the left atrial appendage. And when blood sits still for too long... It clots. I'm getting a visual of that thickening, almost jelly-like consistency forming. Exactly. And if one of those clots breaks loose, it can travel to the brain, blocking a blood vessel, and, nah. well, that's when a stroke occurs. Okay, so we've established that AFib can be this, like, silent risk factor for yeah. stroke. Right? Yeah. So that kind of begs the question, what can you actually do about it? Yeah. The research that you sent mentioned blood thinners, uh -huh. but it also hinted that it's not always so straightforward. Yeah, it's not. So let's unpack that a little bit. Okay. First, remind me how blood thinners, or anticoagulants as they're officially called, actually work. Do they really thin your blood? So that's a common misconception. Okay. They don't actually change the consistency of your blood, mm -hmm. but what they do is they make it harder for clots to form. Okay. So think of it less like thinning, more like we're greasing the wheels, so to speak. Keep things moving smoothly through your blood vessels. Okay, that's a much better visual than blood turning watery. Right. Yeah, so they, they reduce the risk of those dangerous clots forming in the heart in the first place. Exactly. But you mentioned that there are also risks associated with taking them. Yeah, right. The main risk with anticoagulants is an increased chance of bleeding. Oh. And that could be anything, you know. It could be easier bruising or, in more serious cases, even internal bleeding. And is the risk, like, the same for everyone? Or are there certain factors that make some people more susceptible to bleeding than others? That's that's where it gets really, you know, interesting and individualized. Okay. Um, your age, other health conditions, even your lifestyle can all play a role in determining your risk level. Wow. And then to add another layer of complexity, the type of anticoagulant matters too. Oh, okay. Your research mentioned DOACs and warfarin. Yeah, I remember seeing those terms. What's the difference? So warfarin has been like the go-to anticoagulant for decades. Hmm. But um, it requires regular blood tests to monitor its effects and adjust the dosage. Okay. DOACs are newer. They don't require that constant monitoring. Hmm. And they generally have a lower risk of major bleeding events. But they may not be suitable for everyone, particularly those with certain you know, pre-existing medical conditions. It sounds like there are a lot of moving pieces here. How does a doctor even begin to determine which approach is right for a particular person? It sounds like there are a lot of moving pieces here. Mm -hmm. How does a doctor even begin to determine which approach is right for a particular person? It's all about personalized medicine. Okay. They'll consider your individual risk factors for stroke. Okay. Things like age, whether you've had a previous stroke, other health conditions like high blood pressure or diabetes, and all of these get factored in. And then they balance that against the potential risks of bleeding with anticoagulants. Precisely. Okay. Yeah, it's a delicate balance. And it's not always a one and done conversation. You know, your health is dynamic, so these discussions might need to be revisited over time as things change. Oh, wow. 
it makes you realize how important it is to be your own advocate and have these open conversations with your doctor, doesn't it? Absolutely. Ask questions, understand the why behind their recommendations, and don't be afraid to voice any concerns that you have. Now, speaking of options, the research you shared also mentioned a procedure called, what was it again? Left atrial appendage closure, or LAA for short. Right. LAAC. It's for people who can't take blood thinners for whatever reason, right? Right. How does that work exactly? So... Remember that little pouch in the heart where I said clots tend to form, the left atrial appendage? Bruh. Well, this procedure essentially seals off that pouch. Oh, it's like shutting down that part yeah. of the heart's plumbing where the trouble starts. Exactly. By closing off the LAA, you dramatically reduce the risk of a clot forming and traveling to the brain. That's fascinating. It seems like a whole other level of intervention. I imagine it's a more complex decision-making process than just considering medication. It is. Okay. LAAC is typically reserved for patients who are at high high risk of stroke but can't tolerate blood thinners okay. due to um, you know a very high bleeding risk or other medical reasons. Yeah. It's not without its own risks, of course, but it can be a life-changing option for the right candidates. This has been such an eye-opening deep dive. We've covered so much ground from understanding the silent threat of AFib and how it increases stroke risk to the role of blood thinners. And even this procedure, LAAC, it feels like the biggest takeaway is the importance of personalized medicine and informed decision making. Would you agree? I completely agree. Knowing your risk factors and having those open conversations with your healthcare provider are crucial steps in taking control of your heart health. So if you were in the doctor's office tomorrow, armed with all this information, what's the one question you would make sure to ask to understand your own personal risk and the best path forward for you? It's something to think about because knowledge is power, especially when it comes to something as important as your heart health.